than a fishing expedition. And we can go now straight to the police press conference. I recognise that Operation Conifer had the potential to damage the confidence in Wiltshire Police, a force that I am proud of and which has a commendable and strong reputation. This damage, I believed, would be due to the views held by some about investigating allegations concerning deceased individuals. Some may have challenges around the costs associated with complex investigations at a time of budget cuts, and perhaps some who have intransigent opinions and will always defend the conduct and behaviour of others, whatever the veracity of those allegations. Mindful of this, I have ensured that this investigation has been conducted fairly, has been conducted objectively, and with respect and without fear or favour. We have gone where the evidence has taken us, whether it supports or negates the allegations. Most importantly, the report does not draw any conclusions as to the likely guilt or innocence of Sir Edward Heath, or make any comment on the action the Crown Prosecution Service may have taken if he was alive today. I have had absolute confidence in the Operation Conifer investigation team, knowing that they would conduct a high quality and in an ethical investigation, where fairness, proportionality and integrity has remained at its core throughout. Every single decision, every element of this investigation followed the guidance from Operation Hydrant, which is the National Police Chief's coordination hub for non-recent child abuse investigations. At no stage has there been any deviation from current advice, guidance or legislation. The Operation Hydrant's advice is compelling, is legal and is proportionate. There is an obligation to conduct an investigation into allegations to establish the facts of the case, to identify offenders, whether deceased or alive, and bring any living offenders to justice. Most importantly, and most obviously, there is a duty to protect and safeguard children and adults who may be vulnerable to abuse today. I would ask others to be mindful that when investigators receive these allegations of child sexual abuse, the investigation team did not know what it did not know. It did not know the circumstances. It did not know the veracity, the risks, the implications or other vulnerability factors until a proportionate, professional and objective investigation was conducted, it would be impossible to identify and safeguard children and other vulnerable adults who may be at risk today. The safeguarding and protection of vulnerable people will continue to be our primary reason for conducting this investigation and my team has not been diverted from this legal and professional responsibility. Children or adults who allege that they are being abused or have been abused must have the trust and confidence in the police. They deserve to be listened to. They deserve to know that they will be taken seriously. They deserve to know the police will support them and they deserve to know that their anonymity will be preserved. That is what I said we would do that is what we have done, and that is what we will continue to do without fear or favour. There has been many views ex expressed as to whether the police should investigate alleged offences committed by deceased people. Notwithstanding the guidance, I believe this was the right thing to do. It was the right moral, ethical and professional thing to do. But I appreciate that every case needs to be judged on its own merits. I am satisfied, satisfied, there were compelling and obvious reasons to investigate allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. As I have said, Sir Edward Heath was an extremely prominent, influential and high profile person who was arguably one of the most powerful people in the world commensurate with the public office and political office he held. The allegations against him were of the utmost seriousness and from a significant number of people. 
I hope people will understand that given these circumstances, it would be an indefensible dereliction of a Chief Constable's duty not to have investigated the allegations against a former Prime Minister, even though he is deceased. I have made it clear from the outset that at the end of this investigation, in line with our intention to be as transparent and as open as possible, we would publish a summary closure report, and that is what we have done today. The publication of this report is also in line with advice issued by Operation Hydrant. The report has been scrutinised by a number of stakeholders and contributors to ensure complete balance, complete accuracy and measure, and only makes findings that can legitimately and realistically be made. The report provides a factual account of, of, a, of the context for this investigation, what the investigation focused upon and how the investigation was conducted. Operation Conifer, by its very nature, was complex, politically sensitive <coughs> and unique. Due to these unprecedented circumstances, I have sought advice, counsel and support throughout this investigation from a number of people. That confidentiality between me and those individuals will remain intact. <coughs> the role of the police service is very clear in the criminal justice process. The police have a duty to investigate and go where the evidence takes us. It is not our role to prove the innocence or guilt, but to simply present the facts. Therefore, this report does not apportion guilt. It does not suggest or conclude guilt. And no inference should be taken from the investigative decisions or conclusions being made by the police. Extreme caution has been given so that no assumptions, no assumptions are publicly drawn about truths or untruths. The presumption of innocence is enshrined in our law and it is the cornerstone of a just and fair process, judicial process. Despite misleading and inaccurate commentary, nobody from this investigation team or I have made any public or private comment or inference as to the hypothetical outcome of a judicial process if Sir Edward Heath were alive. Any such comments or hypotheses would be flawed by their very nature. They are misleading and they distort the criminal justice process. Wiltshire Police has and will continue to do all that we are able to protect the anonymity of those people who have come forward. This report will therefore not identify the details of any people who have made disclosures of sexual abuse. I understand that there is an insatiable appetite by some to identify the victims. I will do everything in my power to prevent this from happening and I would urge all of you here present today to respect what I am saying about anonymity. In order that this investigation has remained ethical, justified and proportionate, an independent scrutiny panel was established to check and challenge the investigation. <coughs> the panel members were given responsibility to examine and test the decision making and the approach by the investigation team. The panel has been provided with detailed briefings, materials and more recently full access to the published report. This scrutiny has proved invaluable and enabled Operation Conifer to remain firmly aligned to the legislation and to the objectives of this investigation. I would like to thank the members of the panel for their time, for their expertise, their challenge and their support to this investigation. In addition to the independent scrutiny panel, Operation Hydrant was asked to conduct two reviews of the investigation itself. Both reviews of the investigation concluded that it was proportionate, it was justified, and it was in compliance with the legislation and guidance. Further scrutiny has taken place during the course of this investigation with a value for money review by Her Majesty's Inspector of Constabulary which was commissioned by the Home Office 
further to an application of central funding. This review concluded that the resources deployed on this investigation had been proportionate and reasonable and commensurate with the scale of the investigation. They made particular reference to the strong governance, the strict financial controls and the staffing levels which were kept to a minimum with low associated costs. In total, 24 people have worked on Operation Conifer at varying points in the last two years. The cost of the investigation is £1.5 million. The Home Secretary has recently approved the Home Office funding of £1.1 million to take into account that this was a national operation, a national investigation, and it was carried out on behalf of the National Police Chiefs Council and commissioned by Operation Hydrant. <coughs> This decision, made by the Home Secretary, I believe undermines the Prime Minister's personal commitment to addressing child abuse that has gone on in the past, as Mrs May said last week, that tended to be sidelined. During the last two years, there has been much commentary in relation to the potential for a judge-led review into Operation Conifer. At this time, I have heard no compelling reasons for such a review, and therefore I am not persuaded to follow this course of action. As I have said, I am clear that it is not the role of the police to judge the guilt or innocence of people, and it is obvious that at the end of this investigation concerning a deceased suspect, there is no potential for a criminal trial. Most of the elements of the criminal justice process are absent. It is my view the suggestion that a retired judge or other judicial appointments could legitimately pronounce the guilt or innocence of Sir Edward Heath <coughs> is ill-conceived. I believe this would neither provide value for money or indeed a legitimate outcome of the guilt or innocence of Sir Edward Heath. Throughout this investigation I have been very clear that Wiltshire Police <coughs> will be as open and as transparent as possible in line with our requirement for the police to, be, to remain accountable to the public. It is only right when an investigation with such significance is conducted, people like me, who make these decisions, should be held to account. The public should be able to judge the leadership of such high profile operations based upon the merit and quality of the investigation that has taken place, not misleading speculation, rumour and inaccurate conjecture. The publication of the summary closure report today <coughs> provides the openness, provides the transparency and provides the public accountability that I, said, that I said there would be. And the report author has complied fully with Operation Hydrant advice on publication. It will now will be a matter for others to evaluate and decide what steps should be taken in relation to the Operation Conifer findings. I recognise that this investigation, the findings and the summary closure report may raise further questions. But I also believe it signals a watershed moment for people and victims who have suggested or implied there has been a state cover-up for some senior figures who may have been involved in child sexual abuse. As many people will know, ICSA, the Independent Inquiry into Child Sexual Abuse, was set up in March 2015 by the then Home Secretary, now Prime Minister, Theresa May. The inquiry was clear from the outset that it was required to identify the extent to which state or non-state institutions have failed in their duty of care to protect children from child sexual abuse. I acknowledge the terms of reference which are currently publicised on the ICSA website regarding allegations of sexual abuse and exploitation by people of public prominence associated with Westminster. I particularly welcome their focus, focus upon allegations of institutional cover-up and conspiracy and they will review the inadequacies of law enforcement responses to the allegations. <laughs> In light of this, I believe the legitimacy, the legality 
and the obvious public interest in this investigation is more relevant and is more crucial today than ever before. The public interest in this case is clear and unequivocal. The statutory responsibility as the Chief Constable to, con to have conducted this investigation without fear, without favour, I trust is now obvious to all. Paul. Thank you, Chief Constable. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. As Mr Veal has set out, I have been the Police Gold Commander for Operation Conifer and have set the strategic direction and oversight for the investigation. On a daily basis, the investigation has been led by the Senior Investigating Officer, Detective Superintendent Steve Kirby and his team. My purpose today is to outline the key elements that relate to the investigation. These are contained within the summary closure report. Accordingly, I will look to set out how the investigation commenced, the policing duty to undertake an investigation in the case of a deceased person, the allegations that have been received and how these have been investigated, and finally, the investigative findings. For those not familiar with the background to the Operation Conifer investigation, it commenced in August 2015, further to a press statement released by the Independent Police Complaints Commission that announced that they were investigating the way that Wiltshire Police had allegedly dealt with a court case in 1994. In the press release, the IPCC outlined that it is its investigation was directly linked to how Wiltshire Police had dealt with information concerning an allegation that Sir Edward Heath may have been involved in the child abuse related offences. The IPCC press statement released into the public domain for the first time the existence of an allegation relating to Sir Edward Heath. Not in the public domain at that time was that four other police forces were also in the early stages of either scoping or undertaking investigations relating to further allegations that had been made against Sir Edward Heath. Set against this context, Wiltshire Police made the decision to make a public appeal on the same day as the IPCC for anyone with information concerning Sir Edward Heath to come forward. In the following two weeks, 118 people contacted Wiltshire Police, other police forces, other agencies, providing information in response to that media appeal. By the end of August 2015, 23 separate victim disclosures had been made against Sir Edward Heath, spanning offending locations covering 11 different police forces. Due to the extent and range of information received, a decision was made nationally by the police service that a consistent, coordinated response was required to investigate the allegations that had been made. As a result, Wiltshire Police were appointed to take the national investigative lead in relation to all existing and any new allegations made against Sir Edward Heath and the Operation Conifer investigation was commenced. During the course of the Operation Conifer investigation, there has been an ongoing commentary in the media concerning the rationale for undertaking an investigation into a deceased person. Accordingly, this is an important question to address. As the Chief Constable touched upon, the College of Policing issued advice to all police forces in 2015 on this issue. The advice sets out that there is a legal duty under Article 3 of the European Convention on Human Rights for police forces to proportionately investigate criminal allegations made against deceased persons. The advice states that the closer the alleged suspect is to the state and the more serious the allegations made against them, then the greater the duty to investigate is. In the case of Sir Edward Heath, due to his public prominence and the office that he held as Prime Minister, this was particularly relevant in relation to the decision to investigate the allegations made against him. The Operation Conifer investigation has followed the College of Policing advice relating to the purpose of an investigation into a deceased person, and throughout has focused on the following four key strategic objectives. Firstly, 
identifying and safeguarding children and vulnerable adults who may be at risk of abuse today. Secondly, seeking to establish the facts concerning allegations of child abuse made against Sir Edward Heath through an objective and proportionate investigation. Thirdly, identifying and where possible bringing to justice any living person who may have committed criminal offences relating to child abuse or associated cover-up. And fourthly, and importantly, attempting to provide public confidence in the police response to allegations that were made. Throughout the investigation, the starting point has always been to consider any current safeguarding issues and whether or not there were allegations made against suspects who were still living. The facts that Edward Heath died in 2005 ensured this remained a realistic possibility and such risks may be present. I now turn to the allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. During the course of the two-year investigation, Operation Conifer received victim disclosures relating to 42 purported individuals. Each disclosure alleged criminal offences had taken place where Sir Edward Heath was the named perpetrator. The disclosures were made either directly by the victim, anonymously, or by a third party, either on behalf of the victim or without their knowledge. The disclosures made ultimately covered 14 different police force areas in the United Kingdom and the Channel Islands. Nine disclosures were made prior to the IPCC and Wiltshire Police press releases in August 2015. The remaining 33 disclosures were received during the course of the two-year Operation Conifer investigation. 34 of the disclosures were made directly to police forces, while seven were made to the NSPCC and one was made to the Independent Inquiry into Child Abuse. During the investigation, it became apparent that one person had made three separate disclosures to the Operation Conifer investigation, where they had purported to be three different individuals. Accordingly, the actual number of distinct people who made disclosures was concluded to be 40 and not 42. The disclosures and the offences span from 1956 to 1992, and each was alleged to have occurred while Sir Edward Heath was a publicly elected Member of Parliament. Two of the offences were alleged to have taken place during the time period 1970 to 1974, when he served as the Prime Minister. The disclosures made against Sir Edward Heath related to offences of child sexual abuse, physical abuse and sexual abuse involving an adult. The level of seriousness of the child sexual abuse disclosures made included allegations of offences of rape and indecent assault against children. <coughs> I now turn to the investigative response. For each of the 42 disclosures that were alleged against Sir Edward Heath, a proportionate investigation has been undertaken. This has been regardless of whether the disclosures were received by way of a direct report through a third party or anonymously. The policing purpose in any investigation is to objectively gather facts and go where the evidence takes us. And the approach adopted during the Operation Conifer investigation was no different. The starting point for each disclosure was to attempt to obtain an account from the, alleged, uh, from the victim who had alleged abuse against Sir Edward Heath. In 24 cases, the investigation was able to obtain a direct account from the victim. In these cases, a victim care plan was put in place, which was tailored to each person's individual needs. In the case of the other 18 disclosures, due to the fact that they had been made by a third party anonymously, or the victim declined to engage further with the investigation, it was not possible to gain a direct, more detailed account. <coughs> Regardless of whether or not a direct victim account could be obtained, the initial approach of the investigation was to consider whether or not there was any living alleged offenders or wider safeguarding considerations. Once these considerations had been addressed, the focus of the investigation was to objectively and proportionately gather any available corroborative evidence. In addition, the investigation considered if there was any apparent identifiable evidential inconsistencies relating to the victim disclosure made. 
Throughout the investigation, there was an attempt to ensure that all inquiries were proportionate, recognising that Sir Edward Heath was deceased and there was no prospect of an evidential file being prepared for the Crown Prosecution Service. As part of this approach, an investigative proportionality matrix was developed to assist decision making. And this led to a number of, number of potential investigative lines of inquiry not being progressed as they were considered disproportionate. This is in contrast to the additional reasonable lines of inquiry that would have been pursued had Sir Edward Heath been alive today. The fact the allegation spanned four decades meant that many of the investigative opportunities that would be available in the criminal investigation today were not available. Additionally, the passage of time between the date of the alleged offending and the subsequent report to the police meant that in certain instances people's recollections had deteriorated over time and potentially relevant documentary records had been routinely and lawfully destroyed. The investigation team therefore had to focus on available ev ev evidential opportunities, which included interviewing individuals who knew Sir Edward Heath, reviewing physical records and identifying independent witnesses. During the course of the investigation, 1,580 investigative lines of inquiry were generated. 1,062 officers' reports were completed and 284 statements were taken or reviewed. In addition to focusing on the availability of evidence to corroborate disclosures that had been made, the investigation also undertook wider proportionate inquiries. These included, but were not limited to, speaking to the following. Close protection officers who provided protection to Sir Edward Heath. Government drivers who had driven him. Members of his private office and personal staff who had provided support to him. Other police forces and law enforcement agencies to establish if they held any relevant information. Inquiries with government departments to establish if they held any records. And a proportionate review of a small number of Sir Edward Heath's private papers held at the Bodleian Libraries was undertaken. At the end of the investigative process, Detective Superintendent Kirby has considered the available evidence and information gathered during the investigation and has concluded a finding in relation to each disclosure made. I now turn to those findings. Firstly, I just want to touch upon the opening comments made by the Chief Constable concerning the role of the police in a criminal investigation. Mr Veal purposefully set out the role of the police is to inve investigate the facts and follow the available evidence. It is not for the police to make comment on the, on the issue of innocence or guilt and to do so would significantly go beyond the policing role and purpose. Mr Veal also touched on the fact that the presumption of innocence until proven guilty is enshrined in our legal system and is a cornerstone of a just and fair society. These factors are critical to the investigation into Sir Edward Heath, who as a deceased person, firstly has not had the opportunity to be interviewed by the police and to respond to the criminal allegations that have been made against him. Secondly, it is national policy that the Crown Prosecution Service will not make a decision as to whether or not the threshold to charge is reached in cases where the suspect is deceased. And finally, only a criminal court can make findings in relation to whether a person charged with offences is guilty or not guilty of offences alleged against them. For each of these reasons, the Operation Conifer Summary Closure Report does not make any conclusions in respect to, to Sir Edward Heath's guilt or otherwise. The National Operation Hydrant Advice concerning the publications of findings does, however, leave it open to the police to conclude if the suspect had been alive whether or not they would have been interviewed under caution in order to establish an account. We have adopted this advice as it appropriately reflects the policing role in an investigation and it transparently allows victims who have made disclosures to understand what the next policing step would have been if Sir Edward Heath had been alive today. The Operation Conifer investigation developed a categorisation approach 
to conclude the outcome for each individual disclosure made. A decision as to where the victim disclosure was concluded to sit within that categorisation was based on an objective assessment by the senior investigating officer of all the available evidence at the conclusion of the investigation. To ensure a consistent approach, an independent panel of relevant senior investigating officers from outside of Wiltshire Police was also commissioned to review the conclusions reached on the categorisation of victim disclosures. So what are our findings? In the case of seven individual disclosures, if Sir Edward Heath had been alive today, it has been concluded he would have been interviewed under caution in order to obtain his account in relation to the allegations made against him. It is important to state that in the case of one of these disclosures, the investigation has gathered information that potentially undermines the victim's account. The offences where he would have been interviewed under caution are one allegation of rape of a male under 16, three allegations of indecent assault on a male under 16, four allegations of indecent assault on a male under 14, and two allegations of indecent, as assault, indecent assault on a male over 16. The purpose of interviewing Sir Edward Heath under caution would have been to obtain his account in relation to the allegations that have been made against him. It is clearly inappropriate to speculate what his response would have been to the allegations put to him, and no inference of guilt should be drawn by the decision to interview him. His account would have been as important as other information and evidence gathered as part of the wider investigation and would have informed the next stages of the investigative strategy. It is important to further state that none of the victim disclosures in this category relate to the time when he was the serving Prime Minister. In the case of 19 individual disclosures, it has been concluded there is undermining information available such that the threshold to interview under caution would not be met. In relation to these disclosures, it has been concluded that either the alleged abuse could not have taken place in the manner and the circumstances that were reported, and or there is information available at the conclusion of the investigation that impacts upon the credibility of the person making the disclosure. In these cases, the extent and type of undermining information was specific to each individual disclosure investigated. In certain instances, the level of undermining evidence was significant. In others, it was less so. Some of the factors taken into account when considering these disclosures included whether the account could have physically taken place as reported, whether there were inconsistencies in relation to the timing or location of the alleged offending, whether there was the existence of third-party material that contradicted the account given, and whether there was available witness evidence that contradicted the disclosure made by the victim. In the case of two people who fall within this category, the senior investigating officer has concluded that there is reason to suspect that the individuals may have attempted to, in attempted to intentionally mislead the police by alleging that they were abused by Sir Edward Heath. In the case of one of these disclosures, a live criminal investigation remains ongoing. In the case of the other, a criminal investigation was undertaken and an individual was formally cautioned for an offence of wasting police time. In relation to the other disclosures made to Operation Conifer, in the case of three disclosures, the person reporting alleged abuse has subsequently concluded that they were genuinely mistaken in naming Sir Edward Heath as the perpetrator. <coughs> In the case of 10 disclosures, the alleged abuse was reported by a third party. In the case of another three, the victim reported the alleged abuse anonymously. In the case of these respective disclosures, no findings have been concluded. Additionally, during the course of the Operation Conifer investigation, three people were arrested in relation to offences concerning alleged non-recent child abuse. Two were later released without charge and the third remains under investigation. The relevant allegations were disclosed as a result of the Operation Conifer investigation, but the subsequent investigation confirmed that they were not directly related 
to Sir Edward Heath. So in conclusion, firstly as the Operation Conifer Gold Commander, I am satisfied that on behalf of the 14 police forces concerned, a proportionate investigation has been undertaken in line with national guidance into the allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. Secondly, I am satisfied that each of the strategic objectives set at the start of the investigation has been completed. I now return to the Chief Constable for his closing remarks. Thank you, Paul. Let me finish by saying this. Firstly, I want to send a specific message to those who have come forward as part of this investigation. I know it takes bravery and I know it takes courage to do so. I hope that you feel as though we have listened to you. We have taken you seriously. We have supported you. We have protected you. And that you have been treated with dignity and respect. People who are victims of abuse in the past, now or in the future, should be reassured. Reassured by the way that Wiltshire Police has listened to victims and survivors and reassured that no matter who the alleged perpetrator of abuse is, we will take your allegations seriously. We will investigate, no matter how difficult that may be. That said, I will remind you again that this investigation has drawn no inference about Sir Edward Heath's guilt or innocence in this case. Operation Conifer has now come to an end, and the ICSA's terms of reference are clear. This watershed moment regarding investigations of people connected to the establishment should not be underestimated. When the Prime Minister was the Home Secretary, she said in Parliament, we have to send a very clear message to everyone involved in child protection, and there can be no excuse for failing to protect them or failing to bring perpetrators to justice. Finally, I would like to recognise and thank the Operation Conifer investigation team. The scrutiny panel believes that this investigation was fair, was sensitive and was rigorous. This applies to complainants and suspects, including Sir Edward Heath. I am proud of the team's compassion and sensitivity towards victims and survivors throughout this investigation. The team have conducted themselves with diligence and expertise. Their values has enabled this investigation to be, con be concluded and completed to the letter of the National Police Chief's guidance. They have not buckled under the pr pressure of relentless external speculation and criticism. They have never lost sight of the need to fulfil the pr principles of this investigation. They have maintained the highest standards of professionalism in the face of persistent negative commentary to ensure that this investigation has not been hijacked and has not been derailed. For that, and for their commitment, and for their dedication for carrying out their roles without fear or favour, they should be commended, and I thank every single one of them for their service. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. That now concludes the live part of the briefing. There will be a short break, and we'll be coming back to do the uh, question and answer session with the print service, which will be off camera. So the uh, police there not taking any questions uh, are at the conclusion of Operation uh, Conifer, saying they weren't drawing any uh, from what I know and have known of the man for 50 years. Uh, I'm in a almost unique position in that I knew him as a child uh, from an age when one is uh, conscious of being able to judge adults at all. Um, early on, he was just a friend of my parents, and uh, I treated him as that. He was not a well-known politician. I think he'd just become an MP. He was really just one of the people who was around in our lives. Uh, from a fairly early point, he used to come on holiday with our family, and uh, I and my uh, siblings had every opportunity to observe him at close hand, and uh, children being children are not unaware of um, the sort of things that are being talked about, and we would have noticed anything, and there was nothing. Uh, when I grew up, uh, I had probably a closer relationship with him, and I knew him to be a man of uh, great integrity, uh, and also 
just not not so idiotic as to go and uh, jeopardise his career and the things he wanted to achieve for himself and for the country by indulging in anything so dangerous and pointless. Um, I'm here really not to criticise uh, the police because I think we know what we all uh, think about the inquiry. I think I would reiterate the point that the inquiry got off on the wrong foot with the uh, broadcast for victims because that guaranteed that uh, people calling themselves victims would uh, come forward. I'm surprised it was not 10,000 people rather than 112. And uh, from one point of view, I'm very grateful to the police for whittling it uh, down from uh, 42 to 6. And it's the remaining six that concern me and uh, my family. And I think uh, a judge-led review that would look at that objectively, because there has been no assessment of the evidence. These are still just allegations. Uh, to have somebody look at the quality and uh, the context and come to some sensible conclusions in an area where a lot of nonsense has been talked I think that's what we need. So that's really what I want to talk about, where we go from uh, here. I think the report uh, is obviously very extensive, and I don't uh, quibble with the lengths that the police have gone to. I'm not sure they've always gone in the right direction, and I think the directions that they should have gone in that they haven't, which have rather surprised me. But I think we are where we are. We have six allegations left. We'd like to have those uh, cleared up and to leave the man's name completely clear and innocent. Questions? Uh, Tom Palmer Tom. from Sky News. Is there any realistic possibility of clearing Sir Edward Heath's name now? Uh, I think our best chance is to do what I'm asking for and what James uh, Gray is asking for. Um, inevitably, whatever conclusion a judge uh, came to, there would be a certain number of people who would choose to disbelieve it because they want to believe what they want to believe. And of those six allegations that he would have been questioned about, they include... Uh, an allegation of rape against a boy aged 11, indecent assault of a 10 year old boy, and indecent assault of a 15 year old boy during paid sexual encounters between 1961 right through to 1992. Does the scale of those allegations surprise you? It wouldn't have surprised me, as I said, if there had been 10 times as many, uh, because people are going to come out of the woodwork to. Uh, I suggest these. I'm not sure the numbers really mean a lot. I think it's the quality of what is being alleged that counts. On the, on the allegations, the six that remain, which are outlined in the report, um, they do vary in, in, in severity. Some of them are extremely severe. Um, that doesn't mean that they're credible. Um, and most of them are actually perfectly incredible. So in the latter ones, Sir Edward was, was guarded 24-7. Uh, by close protection officers, and there's no possibility whatsoever that he could possibly have done the things that were alleged. For much of that time, he had uh, a very active thyroid, thyroid problem, was taking medication, which meant that he was not sexually active for a very long time, from the early 80s onwards. So the likelihood of these things being occurred is, is pretty remote, I think. But of course, they are serious allegations. As if I were to say to one of the journalists present in the room today, you are a robber. That would be a serious allegation. The police would be required to look into it. I'm confident that none of the journalists in the room today are indeed robbers. But nonetheless, the police would look into it. And that's where we are with this inquiry here. Uh, these are allegations, they're serious allegations. It's right the police looked into them. But because they, would look, because they uh, are of the level they are, that does not presume in any shape, size or form that there's any kind of guilt attached to them. Uh, I'd like to see a judge that inquiry. It may be the ICSA, the Independent Child, Sport, Child Sex Inquiry, um, uh, will look into them, although I think probably not. I think they're probably beyond their remit, and they probably won't do so, which is why probably the last hope that we have of clearing up the remaining five or six uh, is an independent judge led inquiry, or perhaps the Home Secretary uh, will take an interest, and I certainly intend to raise the matter with her uh, at Home Office Questions of the House of Commons a week on Monday. Uh, can I just interrupt there to yeah. say that there is, uh, seems to be a suggestion on the part of the police that passing this on to ICSA means that the police have 
done their job. Um, up to a point, they have done their job, but they are implying that ICSA will somehow deal with the problem. It's not going to address the truth of the allegations at all. It's only interested in institutional shortcomings. Um, so what would be left is a black cloud that cannot be dispersed, and that seems to me not to be justice. Sorry, um, Tom Payne from the Daily Mail. Um, do you think that those who made um, false allegations um, should now be prosecuted, these fantasists that you refer to? It's not high on our list of concerns. Uh, <laughs> obviously, if they're the kind of people who will continue to do it, then that they should be uh, dissuaded. But I think it draws attention to a larger problem, which is that what we're talking about today is a, an attack on a public figure who has the unique advantage for internet trolls of being dead. People can write about him in print. They can't be sued uh, for libel. If this is allowed to proliferate, then it can be aimed at uh, living people, and not just uh, public figures, but the man in the street, so you or me. Uh, if these allegations are anonymous, uh, it's all out there, but you don't know who your um, accusers are. A couple have, I think, been given police cautions for wasting police time. Um, the sad thing is, Lincoln correctly says, there are foolish, mad, sick, sad people out there who think it amusing to make allegations of all kinds about public figures. Uh, I feel sorry for those people, and they certainly need to be dealt with, certainly need to be discouraged, uh, but they should never be believed. Uh, and especially now on, on, on uh, social media, uh, the Chief Constable is saying that he's received something like two Two million Twitter responses in all of this. Uh, who are those people? We have simply no idea at all. Uh, the police's job and our job uh, is to investigate serious allegations, which is the six that remain. They are serious allegations. They're worthy of further investigation. Uh, Lincoln and I don't believe there's a shred of evidence that supports them, but nonetheless, uh, they're serious allegations. They must be uh, looked into. The other 112 have been dismissed. Uh, and I think if those people are serious time wasters, uh, then uh, there should be steps taken against them. But these days, the social media and 24-hour rolling news, quite difficult to dissuade people from doing that kind of thing. Hmm. Steve Morris from The Guardian. When you, see this, when you say that there's a shred of evidence with regard to those six or seven, how do you know that? Uh, are you, do you know more about the allegations than we know from the report? Yes, uh, indeed. Uh, the report, as I say, we need time to read it in the last hour or so and watch the Chief Constable on on television a moment ago giving his press conference, so uh, there will be a lot more analysis to be done of the report. But as I understand it, and we also had a, a confidential briefing from the Chief Constable last night, as I understand it, he goes to length to say there's not a shred of evidence to suggest that those allegations are correct. They are allegations, and if he were alive today, they are allegations which would then be investigated. Because he is not alive today, the, the Chief, Chief Prosecutor says you may not investigate them. And therefore, they have not been investigated. There is no evidence whatsoever they are correct. All they are at this stage is six people make an allegation. Fred Bloggs is a burglar, and the police are required, therefore, to examine, look into Fred Bloggs and his burglary or lack of it. In this case, there's not one shred of... Well, with me is uh, Robert Vaudry, who was Sir Edward Heath's private secretary from 1988 until 1992. He's uh, also a Conservative councillor. Um, over child sex abuse allegations if he were alive today. Operation Conifer has divided opinion with critics saying it's been a £1.5 million waste of money. But others claim the police and those making the allegations have been victims of a chilling campaign to silence them. Sky's Tom Parmenter has this report. He is the Prime Minister that took us into Europe. 45 years on, as we're about to leave the EU, Sir Edward Heath's whole legacy is on the line. Wiltshire police are about to publish what they can about allegations of child sexual abuse, an investigation into someone who died in 2005. His godson, the sculptor Lincoln Seligman, doesn't want to second guess what they will say, but is dismayed at how they've handled it. They have allowed it to appear to come from the Chief Constable that the Chief Constable believed Heath to be 120% guilty, which is not 
what a police chief should be saying when he's conducting an investigation. This was their first appeal outside their suspect's former home in Salisbury. However many new leads they received, using their suspect's home as a backdrop was just a bad call. They are expected to acknowledge that that publicity stunt was wrong, but Wiltshire Police will make no apology for their investigation. The bill for Operation Conifer runs into millions of pounds. Detectives have gathered information and witnessed statements going back decades. You know, whoever you are, however prominent you are, if there are credible allegations, then credible allegations should be pursued. Sir Edward Heath didn't marry, he never had children. As he turned 80, he insisted to Sky News that he'd led the fullest of lives. Edward Heath at 80, no regrets. No. Well, no, that's going far too far. Of course, everybody has some regrets in life. I mean, I regret that we didn't win the 74 election, obviously. Uh, but that doesn't prevent one having a happy life in uh, politics and in other ways. It's understood the police will say that they would have interviewed Sir Edward Heath under caution had he been alive. Whether they'll provide any definitive conclusions is an entirely different matter. Tom Parmenter, Sky News, Salisbury. Well, with me now is Robert Vaudry. He was Sir Edward Heath's private secretary from 1988 until 1992 and is now a Conservative councillor. Welcome to you. Good morning. Do you think this investigation should have been undertaken? Uh, I think the allegations were so serious that, so yes, just because you're a former prime minister doesn't mean you're immune to investigation. But there are clearly uh, issues that I would have with the way the investigation has been carried out. But, um, but that there was an investigation, no problem with that at all. I mean, you presumably have been questioned by the police in the course uh, Twice. Of... I've been interviewed twice. And did you say to them that you ever had any doubts or worries about Sir Edward Heath's contact in you know, relation to this? No, I said that I had no doubt whatsoever that there were no allegations that um, were justified that had been put forward to me. C can I give you one example of, of the way sure, the police please, questioned? Please. So w when they first questioned me, they said um, male prostitutes were being, they had an allegation that male prostitutes, so not paedophiles, but male prostitutes were being brought through his back garden into his house, and that's why the police wouldn't know that it was happening. I pointed out that A, he had a river at the back of his garden, so unless they swam, that clearly wasn't going to happen, and that B, his whole guard back garden has sensors underneath it, so whatever happened, dogs walked across it, the sensors go off. So clearly that was an allegation that just wasn't true and stood up to the, no scrutiny whatsoever, and then they admitted they hadn't been to his house and perhaps that's something they should do. And that was halfway through the, the um, investigation. And this is Wiltshire Police. This is, so this is, this is Wiltshire their, Police. Patch, it it, it was. Well, I think they brought in consultants to help them. Yeah. But at that point, in, you know, in, in the interview, you're just sitting there thinking, really? Is this the level of detail they're involved in? Now, to, to put it, 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 it as crude as I mean, Sir Edward is, I think, one of only four prime ministers who's been a bachelor. He himself was permanently surrounded by security even after he retired, wasn't he? Uh, somewhat, somewhat unusually, they were effectively his sort of surrogate family almost. Uh, absolutely. Between his private office and security yeah. and his driver, we were his closest confidence for, for many years. So since, I'm not sure when he began to have security, maybe it was yeah. when he was leader of the opposition, but right the way through my time with him, he was never without security in one form or another. Hey, we understand that these allegations are going to go back to before he was Prime Minister, I mean, to, you know, almost the 1950s and, and, and eras like that. I mean, do you think it's even possible now, with the mist of time, to come up with any conclusion? One of the areas they were focusing on with me, and it wasn't, I didn't know him then, but it was 1967, where they had this allegation that he picked someone up on the A2 um, in a car, and there was this big thing about could he drive. And I think someone had said he couldn't drive. As it happened, uh, I once hired him a car. Um, he was actually stopped by the police, ironically, when he was driving it because he was so slow. And actually, his security officer agreed that he would drive the car. But the, um, the date they had in mind, um, it turns out he was in Paris. So he wasn't on the A2 when he allegedly picked this individual up. Um, but this whole issue about whether uh, he would have been interviewed had he been alive because of some of the allegations, um, you know, rather than admit that the the information wasn't true, they said, well, maybe it was another date, maybe the date was wrong, and it was another day when he was driving back up on the A2. 
It's, uh, they've stretched the credibility of the investigation almost to the point of, were he alive, mm. I do wonder whether he could have actually claimed harassment by the police in this instance. Now, we understand that the police are going to say that they believe it would have been justified to interview him under caution. Of course, <coughs> lots of people have been interviewed under caution. It doesn't mean that they've uh, done anything wrong. Do you think that degree of uh, standing up, if you like, their investigation is justified? No, I mean, I've been interviewed under caution. It meant absolutely nothing. It was just the police going through a due process, as they should have done in the instance. There, was a, um, there have been some severe allegations made against him. Again, because he was a former prime minister, it doesn't mean he should be immune from being investigated under caution if, when they've done their interviews elsewhere, there are certain allegations that they can't prove in time or they can't prove were, were false. And he should, be, he should have been allowed the opportunity to clarify where he was, what his interpretation of. The fact is, he's passed away. He's not able to do that. No, I mean, it's also fair to say, isn't it, that the most lurid allegations have now been completely discounted. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, what, what, what were those and what happened? Well, he, he, some of the allegations were that there were murders, that there was a, a group of senior establishment figures. And I have to say, I don't think Sir Edward ever would have considered himself to be part of the establishment, ironically. But there were, there were views that uh, there were murders, there was a paedophile ring. Um, it was caught up with um, you know, other establishment figures. Uh, that's all been dismissed, as I understand it, as being completely fictitious and no grounds whatsoever for it. And as someone who, who worked with him closely and knew him, what would be your view of his sexuality? Uh, my view would be he's completely asexual. Um, you know, I, I, I was relatively young when I worked for him. We didn't have too many conversations about life. I mean, he used to be amused if I was dating someone. Um, and, and people had this view that he didn't really like women. I have to say, he, he adored intelligent women. And depending who would be sort of in his company, if there were sort of career women or you know, people with interesting roles, he'd absolutely warm to them and be very engaging. But with anyone, male or female, he just wasn't that interested if you weren't, you know, I suppose, a an interesting individual. In that sense, he was quite a harsh personality. But uh, I had absolutely no grounds ever in my time, and I was very close to him for those four years I worked for him, and before and after. Uh, I have absolutely no grounds to assume there was anything untoward um, in his private life or that he was anything other than asexual. Now, you've been very clear that you think this investigation is perfectly legitimate for the police to pursue yeah. it initially. Do you think the zeal with which they pursued it or the way in which they're continuing with it now is uh, justifiable? So, we know the report will come out later today. I think there are two things that should happen whatever the report says. One is that the Chief Constable of Wiltshire should ask the IPCC to investigate himself Secondly, and I think the jury is out whether police and crime commissioners are as effective as we were led to believe they would be, but the Wiltshire Police and Crime Commissioner should undertake an investigation into the activities of the Chief Constable, regardless of what this report says when it's formally released. And those two investigations should be allowed to you know, go their course and we'll find out. But the fact it was launched outside his house with that PR campaign, the fact there have been judicious leaks in, during the campaign, usually designed to either justify the Chief Constable's position or the, what the Wiltshire Police have been doing. Just seems to me that whole process needs to be formally investigated. So you so think there are, are, there's possible misconduct? Yeah, I do think there's possible misconduct, yes. OK, we should say that the uh, Wiltshire Police uh, have put out a statement on behalf of Chief Constable Mike Veal, uh, which says, amongst other things, this investigation has followed and complied with national guidance from the outset uh, uh, and throughout, and this extends to the publication of the report. Uh, we, as the police service, had an obligation to progress in a proportionate and fully accountable manner. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Questions of child sex abuse were he alive today. A controversial investigation lasting two years continues as police believe two people involved may have tried to mislead them. Also today, cabinet ministers rally round Theresa May after her. Calamitous conference speech amid claims some MPs say she's one crisis from the exit. A terminally ill man with motor neurone disease fighting for the right to end his life loses his high court battle. And new car sales fall for the, fall for the sixth month in a row. Economic uncertainty and plans to improve air quality could be to blame. Also, Prince Charles says deteriorating coral reefs are a serious wake-up call to the plight of the seas as Sky promises to ban single-use plastics. We must act now. How otherwise? How?
Will future generations ever forgive us? Hello and good afternoon. The former Prime Minister, the late Sir Edward Heath, would have been questioned by police over accusations of child rape and indecent assaults on children. A controversial report released by police an hour ago also said that two people who reported abuse may have attempted to mislead officers. If Sir Edward Heath had been alive today, it has been concluded he would have been interviewed under caution in order to obtain his account in relation to the allegations made against him. It is important to state that in the case of one of these disclosures, the investigation has gathered information that potentially undermines the victim's account. The offences where he would have been interviewed under caution are one allegation of rape of a male under 16, three allegations of indecent assault on a male under 16, four allegations of indecent assault on a male under 14 and two allegations of indecent, as assault, indecent assault on a male over 16. Well, the investigation known as Operation Conifer has divided opinion, with critics saying it's been a £1.5 million waste of money, while others claim that the police and those uh, making the allegations have been victims of a chilling campaign to silence them. Chief Constable Mike Veal defended the decision to investigate. I believe this was the right thing to do. It was the right moral, ethical and professional thing to do. But I appreciate that every case needs to be judged on its own merits. I am satisfied, satisfied, there are compelling and obvious reasons to investigate allegations made against Sir Edward Heath. Well, let's turn to our crime correspondent, Martin Brunt, who's in Swindon. Uh, Martin, very good afternoon to you. Uh, can we start with the words of Ken MacDonald, former Director of Public Prosecution's most senior prosecuting role in the land? He has talked uh, in the last hour or so about um, a, a force which is covering their backs, covering their uh, backs at the expense of a dead man. Shame on them, he says. Yes, I mean, very strong words indeed uh, from... Um from Ken MacDonald, uh, the former director of public prosecutions, um, and making it clear that uh, he disagrees with what he sees almost as a default position now for police forces uh, who are faced with allegations of child sex abuse, that there is this default position of uh, believing those who are making the complaints um, and uh, putting that above a sense of fairness in those investigations. So uh, he's pulling no punches about what he feels um, of, uh, of what Wiltshire Police have been up to. Constable of Wiltshire Police, we hope to speak to him in the next 20 minutes or thereabouts, said that were he alive today, Sir Edward Heath, then he would face questioning under caution. How high is the evidential bar required to question somebody under caution? Well, it's really, I think, up to individual police uh, forces where they set that bar. But again, uh, Ken MacDonald, Lord MacDonald, the former DPP, has said that in the case of somebody who's dead, uh, he feels that that bar uh, is going to be pretty, pretty low indeed. Um, it's fair to say, I think, that listening to the Chief Constable Mike Veal here, he clearly feels vindicated. I mean, this is really his first chance after two years to speak in depth and answer what's been very widespread criticism of this investigation, dismissed by uh, supporters of Sir Edward Heath, family members of Sir Edward Heath and many others as nothing more than a fishing expedition. Now, um, what we've heard from uh, the police force today uh, suggests in this summary report uh, that we've read, suggests a very um, meticulous investigation. I'll give you some idea of, um, of the kind of details that we've been given. 284 statements were taken uh, during this two-year investigation and the force a team of detectives of about 24, a couple of dozen, have tracked down uh, former protection officers, police officers, who worked with uh, Sir, Sir Edward, um, drivers, uh, yacht crews. Remember, um, he owned five yachts 
uh, and uh, performed at a professional level as a yachtsman. Um, members of his yacht crews have been interviewed, uh, domestic staff um, at his homes in London and Kent uh, and in Salisbury, uh, and some of the nurses who cared for him in the last years of, um, of his life. Um, accused of uh, a fishing expedition, the chief constable said it would have been indefensible for him and his force not to have investigated uh, such serious allegations. Um, even though he said that there was never any intention at the end of it to draw conclusions as to uh, Sir Edward Heath's guilt uh, or innocence. It was really to establish whether there was enough evidence um, in which, if he had been alive, to interview him under, a, uh, under caution. And in fact, as we've heard, uh, they did find grounds in seven cases uh, that uh, they would have taken the decision to interview him under caution. Now, you've read out uh, some of those seven allegations that police deemed uh, to have found evidence. Um, the police talk about a child or a, or a male under 15, under 16. The details are um, that one of those allegations was the rape of a boy who was 11 years old, and that was an offence alleged to have taken place in London in 1961. Um, the, uh, the second of those seven more damning allegations was the uh, indecent assault of a boy aged 10. So we're talking in those allegations of, uh, of alleged victims who were very young indeed. Um, we've heard from the, in, in the last few minutes from Sir Edward Heath's godson who has described um, the investigation uh, in disparaging terms and said that it was an investigation into a suspect uh, who couldn't defend himself. This is what Sir Edward Heath's uh, godson has said in the past few minutes. The inquiry got off on the wrong foot with the uh, broadcast for victims because that guaranteed that uh, people calling themselves victims would uh, come forward. I'm surprised it was not 10,000 people rather than 112. And uh, from one point of view, I'm very grateful to the police for whittling it uh, down from uh, 42 to 6. And it's the remaining six that concern me and uh, my family. We've talked about uh, where the police did find grounds that would have led to uh, the questioning of Sir Edward Heath, but there were, amongst those 42 allegations, things that didn't go anywhere, that the police couldn't corroborate uh, any, uh, any, uh, any of the allegations. Um, just to give you again an example uh, or a flavour of those kind of um, bits, two people uh, the police believe may have intentionally misled police by making allegations of abuse against uh, Sir Edward Heath. Um, one of those is still being investigated. Uh, another of those two was given a police caution. Um, there were six uh, claimants who made allegations of Sir Edward Heath being involved in satanic or ritual abuse. Um, two of those have since died, we, we were told this morning. Um, again, there was no corroborative evidence to suggest that any of those claims uh, were true. Um, we're going to hear uh, over the next hour or so more details from the Chief Constable and from the Police and Crime Commissioner who, um, who will be answering uh, questions and again addressing the widespread criticism uh, that's been uh, levelled against them over the past few months. But as I said at the outset, there is a feeling here that, uh, that the chief officers of Wiltshire Police are clearly feeling vindicated in their investigation. Uh, Martin, thanks very much indeed. Uh, just a line on the Anglo-British author Akashio Ishiguro, who uh, the, has just won the Nobel Prize for Literature, the 2017 Nobel Prize for Literature for Akashio Ishiguro. Cabinet ministers have rallied to support Theresa May. Inquiry, a judge-led review into the, how the police handled this investigation, but that's something that the chief constable here at Wiltshire Police said isn't necessary. Uh, so now the uh, police have, uh, at the end of this investigation, this two-year investigation, uh, they have whittled down uh, a large number of allegations that were made effectively to this smaller number, and now... 
Uh, they say it's up to others to decide if anything more will be done. Well, that's right, but they were very keen, Anita, to stress in that news conference that these allegations have now been made public. Uh, despite that, it doesn't mean that Sir, Sir Edward Heath is guilty and it doesn't mean that he's innocent. Uh, now, what's going to happen next is the independent inquiry into child sex abuse. Uh, they have made a formal request for the report by Wiltshire Police. They've made that request so they can look at this report now and what they say is that they want to consider it as part of uh, its Westminster investigation. Uh, they go on to say they will investigate whether there was any knowledge within Westminster institutions and if so, what actions were taken. But important to stress though that these allegations, despite them being uh, made public, it doesn't mean that Sir Edward Heath is guilty. It doesn't mean he's innocent. The CPS, the Crown Prosecution Service, can't uh, say what the strength of the evidence is because he is no longer alive. But the man himself, he is not here, of course, today to answer any of those allegations. And that's something that his supporters, his friends are very cross about. He, they think that this will leave a very dark stain on his reputation. Helena, thank you very much. Uh, Helena Lee at Wiltshire Police Headquarters in Swindon. And the time. Chief Constable of Wiltshire many times over the last 12 months. He's a man of high integrity, he's a public servant. He's been tasked with a very difficult, high profile investigation into a, a former Prime Minister. And I've got great confidence in the integrity of the investigation and his team. And I think it's quite right that there should be an investigation. There were a large number of uh, allegations against uh, the former Prime Minister uh, from across the country. And uh, it was decided that Wiltshire would take control of all these and investigate them properly uh, and I think there probably would be uh, very secretly a lot of chief constables around the country at different forces were very relieved when uh, it was decided that Wiltshire were going to do this difficult issue. Well it is, the truth is a lot of other police forces looked into it and found that there was nothing there it seems that uh, it's Mike Veal who's wanted to pursue this. Well, I think uh, it's the job of the police to follow the evidence wherever it leads. And I think, you know, people will say it's, it's a waste of money, there can never be a conviction. And it's not the job of the police to convict anybody. Their, their job is to gather the evidence. It's for judge and jury to convict in our country under, under our system of law. Um, obviously, because Sir Edward Heath is uh, deceased, there will, no, there will never be a trial. But I think the closer you are to power, the more important is people realise that we are all under equal under the law and given the concern around the allegations against uh, this man uh, it's quite right that this investigation has been conducted thoroughly and professionally and we're going to see the results and the conclusions of it today mr campbell what do you think uh, has been done in the course of this inquiry that's been improper well, I think it's very odd that the police are involved at all with a man who is long dead. This is a matter for historians, possibly journalists, to investigate. There is no, I've spoken to policemen who think it's a complete waste of time because there are no charges able to be brought because Sir Edward is long dead. It's nothing to do with the police. They could be investigating Jack the Ripper if they wanted. It's, 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 there is no, the police are there to investigate charge. If he was still alive, yes, of course, he would be questioned. And I would hope and expect that the, the allegations would fall by the wayside. But given that he's long dead, and a lot of the evidence uh, seems to be very dubious, I don't think it's a, it, it is anything to do with the police to be investigating this at all. All right, you, of course, investigated the life of Sir Edward Heath. You've written a biography of him, prize-winning biography. Did you ever have any suspicions about his sexual behaviour? Absolutely not at all. I've, I mean, it seems to me that it's entirely out of character and not something that anybody who knew him would have believed possible. Um, I, I th and, and it's logistically, as a lot of people have said, very difficult to imagine how heavily guarded as he was all the time, that he would have had any opportunity to do this even if he'd wanted to. It seems to me most of the evidence is very spurious and has been exploded. We'll see this morning what comes up, what, what water any of these allegations hold. And I can see that if he was still alive, the police would have, would have, would have wanted to question him. 
But it seems to me that, and standing outside his house as they did, asking victims to come forward is is is, is completely improper way for the police to have proceeded. Um, I think it's been a very odd inquiry indeed. Um, it's a lot of publicity hunting by the police, frankly. I mean, Mr. Bridgman, uh, why was the inquiry launched in front of Ted Heath's house? And you don't normally launch an inquiry asking for evidence. You normally launch an inquiry because you've been presented with evidence. Why did the Wiltshire Police do it that way? Well, there, there already was a large number of allegations um, prior to the initiation of Conifer, which is the reason that Wiltshire initiated the investigation. And I just want to come back so on they, something they, that John has said about, you know, why is this being... I mean, why, Nick's why, why allegations, the allegations of the madam, uh, those didn't stand up, did they? And yet this investigation uh, was pursued. Well, at the end of the day, Edward Heath was, one of, was, was the, uh, probably the fifth most powerful man in the world when he was prime minister. If there's any truth at all in these allegations, any truth at all, then he was a major security risk. Obviously, the next question would be, how has this been covered up for so long? And I would maintain that there is a current security risk associated with anybody who's been covering this up, and, and that's a national security but risk. You, you're being logically inconsistent, aren't you? You're saying, on the one hand, we should all be treated equally, and then you're saying that because someone is powerful, uh, they should be investigated to extraordinary lengths, even when it appears to be a smear. Be well, you, th that's your words. You haven't seen the report, I presume, Adam, and in indeed I'm going to go and see it in, in a moment. But well, I mean, a obviously, lot of, a lot of, a the, lot the of people, national, a lot of you, you must appreciate the national, national. A lot of people think you have been in receipt of leaks uh, during the course of this inquiry from uh, Mike Veal, which you've been played a part in making public. Is that true? I've had a number of briefings uh, with Mike Veal over the last 12 months. We've talked about a lot of issues related to child abuse. Uh, the contents of those conversations are obviously sensitive and, uh, and uh, will not be divulged. And, uh, and, and, and they're going to remain in that situation. Do you think it's proper that while an inquiry is active, you should have received those briefings? Absolutely. And what I think, you, what I think your viewers will appreciate is that no police inquiry prior to its release of its final report has come under the sustained barrage of criticism that Mike Veal and Operation Conifer and his detective team have come under and I think that also says a lot uh, about this whole issue and, and I, I think it's my duty as an MP to defend him. Ms Cameron, what do you think of an MP being briefed on the, in the course of an inquiry? I would have thought it was unusual and probably improper, but I don't really know what the conventions and etiquette are in, 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 the, in, these, in, the, in these matters. But it does seem that this inquiry has been conducted in semi-public with a lot of leaks and um, hints and, as you say, smears, um, which is not the way inquiries normally are conducted or should be conducted. Do you think that uh, Sir Edward Heath has been investigated properly because he was such a prominent figure uh, or been treated improperly as an ordinary citizen? I assume it is because he is a former Prime Minister and it's a newsworthy um, investigation that, uh, you know, there were always, I'm not surprised that allegations of this sort have emerged about him. There were always people, because he was unmarried, and people always used to ask me when I was writing about him, is he gay, is he gay? There were always sort of, there was, there was, and as soon as we got the whole Jimmy Savile thing and all sorts of public figures were under suspicion, I wasn't in the least surprised that everybody said, oh, what about Ted Heath? But there is no evidence for this at all. And I think it would be entirely out of character. He was a very protective of his privacy. He was very afraid. He'd been chief whip. He knew about scandals destroying people's careers. He would not have taken the risks of this sort, even if he'd wanted to. I find the whole completely out of character and improbable. And we'll see what the report says, but I would be very surprised if there is very much in it. And it's, but it's the fact that it's been in the public eye for the last, what, year? Now, Mr. Bridgen, what do you think is uh, the most concerning piece of evidence that you've heard? Well, I'm not going to comment on a report which is going to be public information in less than an hour's time. I'm going to go back into 
police headquarters here at Swindon. I'm going to get a copy of the final report, which I have not seen because it's been an evolving document, and I think the, the final draft was only authorised you know, a couple of days ago. Um, it's clear that you know, most people in the country, Adam, are not going to read this report, perhaps not one in 100,000, unfortunately. Most people are going to take their lead from the way that the media report uh, receiving this report. And I just hope that the media are fair and open-minded because this is a huge issue and there are, there are potential victims involved here and uh, they need to be thought of as well. And on another topic, uh, Mr Bridget, what do you think? Is uh, Theresa May finished? It was a difficult day, uh, day yesterday. Uh, the most important thing is that we... Uh, hold the Conservative Party together because the real tragedy would be if we end up with Jeremy Corbyn getting into number 10 Downing Street. That would be a tragedy for the whole country and we need to hold the Conservative Party and the government together and move forward. Does that mean holding it together under Theresa May or making a change? Um, I think we're going to carry on with Theresa May certainly until we get through the Brexit process. Thank you very much indeed both of you for joining me.